Shalom Aleichem. And welcome everyone as uh, Baruch Hashem. We went through the Yom Tov of Shavuot. We've all accepted the Torah. And this week we're at Parshat Naso. Parshat Naso is actually the longest Parsha that we read. And um, I believe that's why it comes right after Shavuot. As soon as you accepted the Torah, as soon as we accepted the Torah, now we're ready to hear the longest Parsha of the uh, Torah. In this week's parasha, we find the um, <clears throat> topic uh, about the sota. Sota is a woman, a married woman, who is a little bit too friendly with men other than her husband. And her husband warns her and tells her to stay away from these men. It's improper. And she disregards the warning. She's seen again with that man and she's seen with witnesses seeing and testifying that she secluded herself in a room with a strange man other than her husband. And not knowing whether she sinned or not, she's taken up to the Beit HaMikdash and the whole Sota process has gone through, goes through, there's a Korban, and then there's the Me Sota, the waters of the Sota, which Hashem's name is uh, written on a parchment and then erased and put into the water, and then she's given to drink. If she's guilty, Shalom, she dies there, and her belly swells, her thighs fall, and uh, the Rambam says the same will happen to the man that she sinned with, wherever he is. But if she's innocent, the Gemara tells us that if she didn't actually sin with that man, then the Gemara tells us Masech Sota, she will bear children more easily. If up until now she had difficult labor, now when she has children, it will be an easy birth. Gemara continues, if her babies had been not such fair skin, now they will have much more fair complexion. If she was barren, Hashem will now give her a child. She's getting a very nice reward. Her children will be nicer, looking better. Her birthing would be easier. And if she didn't have children, now she will. It seems to be a reward. But you have to ask yourself, a reward for what? That she secluded herself with a strange man after her husband already told her to stay away? She had to go through this whole degradation, this whole process, and yet we're rewarding her? She acted inappropriately. Not the way that a Bat Yisrael, that a Jewish woman, should be acting. Harav Eliyahu Lapiyon Zechat Tzadik Lebracha brings the Gemara Masech HaMakot. The Gemara Masech HaMakot tells us that one who sits and refrains from doing an Avera, and the way the Gemara Masech HaKadushin explains it, that he has the opportunity for sinning, and he doesn't sin, Hashem counts that as a mitzvah. This woman secluded herself with a man. Totally inappropriate. And at that moment, she could have sinned. Would have been easy to. Everything already got set up. But she didn't. Hashem rewards for that as well. Yes, putting herself in that situation was totally wrong. And for that, there will be a re required to pay for that. But the fact that she didn't sin, that re deserves reward as well. It just tells us every time we're dealing with a challenge, we feel, ah, we already messed up so much. Let's just continue to do whatever we want, continue to mess up. That's not the way it works. Every time that we ha fight the challenge, every time we beat the challenge, even just the fight of the challenge, even if you don't beat the challenge, every time you fight, and you try to stop it, that in itself is rewardable. However, the Chassam Seifer gives another answer. So we have our answer from earlier up beyond, and the answer is that she didn't end up sinning, so that in itself requires a reward, that's why she got those rewards. But the Chassam Seifer explains with another answer. He explains that she went through a humiliating ordeal. She was suspected of the worst behavior, Publicly, she had to walk around and everyone knew that she was a Sotah. 
In the words, she had to say words and had to tell her things. The shame was great. But we learn that shame gives kapara. Rav Chaim Vital, the student of the Arizal, he writes that the Arizal said that Rabbi Yirmiyo earned the highest position, one of the highest positions in Gan Eden. And he is the one who asks questions, Rabbi Yirmiyo asks questions in the Yeshiva Shemela, in the heavenly Yeshiva. Rav Chaim writes that he heard from his Rebbe, the Arizal, that when he was in Yeshiva, Rabbi Yirmiyah would always ask questions to his Rebbe. He would never let the lesson go by without asking all his questions to clarify his knowledge. But it reached a point that everyone else in the Beit Midrash already got tired of all his questions. They just wanted the shear to come and go. And so he was forcefully removed from the Beit Midrash. And because of his humiliation, the Chachamim, because of the humiliation before the Chachamim, when he came to Shemayim, they gave him the highest position. They gave him the one to ask questions in the Yeshiva Shemala. He didn't fly off the handle. He didn't complain and say, what you doing? He accepted the humiliation and he got there. About a hundred years ago, it was a city in Lithuania the city, the town of Shavil. And there was a, you know, in the olden days, when they used to do the laundry, at, uh, there's no washing machine. So uh, you can ask your grandmas or great-grandmothers how they used to do it. From my understanding, they would take the clothing and they would you know, warm up the water, put a detergent in with their hands or some other apparatus. They would scrub. It would take a couple of hours. It'd be a whole day affair if you were doing the whole family's laundry. And then there was no dryer, so you had to hang them outside. So there was a woman, oh, she went ahead and she was doing her family laundry and she was hanging it outside, as was the derech, as was the way of all the people to do in the town. And another woman was coming home that day and she had a bad day. And when she came home, they were on the clothesline, there were two large sheets drying. Now, she would need to bypass the sheets and go around to get to her apartment. But today just wasn't her day. And she wasn't interested in going all around. So she, very upsetly ready from a bad day that she had, she took the two sheets, threw them to the muddy ground, and went into her house. And she saw that her neighbor, who the sheets belonged to, was watching her, but she didn't care. And she just ran into her house, and the neighbor didn't say anything. It was a few days later, and the son of the lady who tossed the two sheets to the floor, her son became seriously ill. They took her to the hospital. The doctor saying there's no chance, he's dying. And so she went to the tzaddik, Harav Shloimo, who was the Leshem, was known as the Leshem, the Leshem Shevo, the Chalma, and she was crying. And she said, please give me a bracha. I want to save my son. I've done nothing wrong. Why did my son become ill? And the Leshem said, listen, nothing happens in a vacuum. Something must have happened. Something must have happened. You've done something to get someone very upset. Then Hashem and I was upset with you. And then she remembers, yes, yes. I took two sheets and I threw them on the ground. I got them all muddy. She probably worked hours in cleaning them. And then she had to do it all over again. And the Leshem told her, you have to go and ask forgiveness before Hashem can forgive you. She ran to the woman's house. She knocked on the door. But the woman's husband opened. She asked to see his wife. He, she said, I have to see her immediately. He said, I'm sorry, but she's not home. What can I do for you? And she goes ahead and she says, I did something terrible to her. And the husband said, no, you, it's not, that can't be. She says, yes, it is. He says, it can't be. She didn't tell me anything. She didn't say anybody hurt her. Anybody did anything to her. I didn't hear anything. So it can't be true. She's, he says, I think you have the wrong house. She says, no, I know. It's, I did it here. I have to apologize. Please let me apologize. And again, the husband says, you have no reason to apologize. This woman comes back to the rub and she says, 
The husband doesn't know anything. And the Rav says, I know that family quite well. That woman is a tzaddiket. She wanted to preserve your dignity and did not tell anyone, not even her husband. You know, that woman, this tzaddiket, up until now, she's had multiple miscarriages. I give her a bracha that Hashem should grant her with a child that will illuminate the hearts and minds of the Jewish people. And a short while later, the Rav's blessing was fulfilled when the woman gave birth to a little boy. She named him Yosef Shalom. Yes, that came out to be Harav Yosef Shalom El Yashiv. It was the product of that blessing, a blessing warranted because the mother preserved the dignity of a woman who had brought her humiliation and grief and pain. If a person goes through humiliation, that pain is a kapara, and that pain brings a bracha. The Chafetz Chaim was once walking down the steps of his house, and he didn't take notice that there was a, a fruit peel in his path. He slipped and fell. And there were some people there who didn't know who he was. And they started to laugh and make jokes of him. When he came to the Beit Midrash that day, he was extra, extra happy. People asked the Chavetz Chaim, what were you so happy about? He said, usually everyone gives me kavod. I don't get busha, I don't get, uh, I don't, no one humiliates me. But busha, embarrassment, is one of the best ways to get kapara. Now, Baruch Hashem, people made fun of me today. Ah, oh, I've been cleansed. I'm happy that the cleansing process happened. Being humiliated and not taking revenge, not answering back. That is an amazing power and that comes with amazing power. The Peninim al shares a story how there was a certain speaker, a woman, she would give big speeches to, to, to women. And uh, once she was speaking, captivating the audience. And all of a sudden, a tall, heavy woman who had wild eyes, filled with anger, came up to where she was speaking, stole the mic and started to scream at the speaker. And she said, you ruined my life. You embarrassed me, you shamed me, you, you ruined my whole life. Because of you, I've been a failure. And right away, the people, the audience got shocked. What's going on? And the speaker calmly said back, I don't know you. I've never met you. You must, must have been mistaken. I'm sorry for your pain. But you must be mistaken. And this woman started to scream louder. You're a liar. I know it's you. It's been you all along. You've caused me all these problems in my life. Now the organizers start coming closer. They, they try to calm her down. And this woman is not being calmed down. She gets louder and louder, wilder and wilder. And the speaker is all red in the face, getting embarrassed, starting to cry, devastated, being humiliated in public. She broke down in tears. And as she was crying, she started to, to tell someone, she looked up and asked someone, please, please get Rachel so-and-so. The organizer called for Rachel, who came up to the front in a few minutes. And the speaker said to Rachel, Rachel, I don't know if you know me so well, but I'm a good friend of your mother. And I know your mother told me that you're having difficulty conceiving and not yet been blessed with a baby. I just went through so much pain, so much sorrow. I'm still being humiliated. But I remember learning that if a person is humiliated, it's a kapara, and they also get a power of giving a beracha. And so right now in that stage, I want to give you a beracha. Now everyone in the crowd was in complete silence, not knowing what will happen next. Even the woman who was accusing her kept silence. And was watching what was happening. One of the organizers walked over to the woman who was accusing the speaker and said, Do you know the name of this person that you said ruined your life? She says, I don't know what her current name is. But when she did it to me, 
Her last name was Kohen. Now, all the organizers got up and said to this woman, our speaker, her maiden name is not Kohen, her maiden name is Chain. And now the accuser, a little bit embarrassed, said, oh, whoops, I guess I made a mistake. Without apologizing or seeking to make amends, she walked off the stage, ignored everyone staring at her, and walked out. The entire room broke into an uproar over the extraordinary act of chesed, which the speaker had the mind to maintain her cool, not lose it, and think about someone else at that moment to give them that beracha. And so we learn the power of what comes with somebody who understands that when Busha does come his way, humiliation does come their way, how it gives them full kaparag, the Hafez Haim said, as well as the power that it gives them to give a berachat to someone. Let's move on to another lesson from this week's parasha. So in this week's parasha, we have something that is very, very famous. We uh, Sifaradim, every single day, do this mitzvah. If we have a Kohen in the Beit Knesset, we do what's known as Birkat Kohanim. Uh, the priestly blessings, which is a threefold bracha. Um, it's a very, very powerful bracha. Uh, in fact, they say that uh, when uh, Harav Steinman uh, would come to to America, so in Eretz Yisrael, even with Ashkenazim, they have um, they have brachat kohanim every single day. Chutz uh, la'aret do for various factors and reasons they don't. But Rav Steinman, when he would come to America, he would make sure to daven in Tzbortel, uh, he would make sure to daven in Svartik Minyonim. This way he would hear the Birkat Kohanim. Um, <clears throat> the Kohen, when making the Beracha, he says something, the Beracha, as Asher Kedish Shalom Tzibit Tzivanu, Levarechet Amo Yisrael Be'ahava. He has to bless the Jewish nation. Be'ahava means with love. Very rarely do we say a bracha with how we do it. I mean, the only, really only other bracha that we do, that we do say how we do it, is kisur adam, that we say we do, that we do the kisur adam, we cover the blood of the animal with the, um, with the earth. There we mention it as well. And for whatever reason we do it there, but majority of berachot, all the berachot in these two, we never say with what we're doing it there. That we're taking the love. Um, that we're washing our hands. We're not saying we're doing it with a, with a coast. We're not, we, we don't say these things. So there has to be a reason why specifically here, when a Kohen, when the Kohanim are giving beracha, they're saying they have to do it with be'ahava. So much so, that the Zara HaKadosh says, in Chaz Shalom. The Kohen has a fight with someone in that Beta Knesset. He cannot go up and uh, he cannot fulfill his obligation to say the Birkat Kohanim, the Ahava. I saw brought down from the Ramchal student, so Moshe Chaim Tato student, the author of the Misra Isharim, right? So his student brings down something unbelievable. He wrote a sefer called Shefte Ka. His name is Rav Moshe David Vale, if I'm reading his last name correctly. He lived between 1697 and 1777 in Italy, in a place called, if I'm reading this correctly, Padua, Italy. And this is what he says. He says, the bracha that we get, that the Kohanim have to say, like we said, says, Sheikh Shamsa Tzivanu, Levarechet Amo Yisrael, Right, He says this fact that they have to give it with love is hinted in the Torah when the Torah says Amor Lahem. Right? The Pasuk says Tabel Aron Banali Mor Kotu Barakhu Bnei Yisrael Amor Lahem. So the Shifteh Ka writes, 
when the Torah wrote Amor Lahem, this was the hint that it has to be done with complete love. And how does he know this? So he writes, the Shifti writes, because the word Amor in multiple languages means love. He writes that in French, and I don't know how to pronounce French words, but in French, apparently the word for love is very similarly related to the word Amor. As well as Latin, Italian, Spanish, the word for love is also closely related to the word amor. He says that amor lahem, that the Torah is telling the Kohanim that it has to be done with full love. The Gemara many times brings down a word, and the Farshim explain, by like totafot, like it means like two and two, and uh, we say it's Africanese. So what all of a sudden we're just bringing all sorts of African and other such languages into our Lashon HaKadosh. No, the truth is that Lashon HaKadosh is the mother language of all languages. And during the Dora Flaga, when the um, 70 languages were created, some words of Hebrew, of Lashon HaKadosh, kind of like jumped into another language and kind of got lost from Hebrew. But it really, it is Lashon HaKadosh. That's the way the Mepharshim explained and this is the way Ravali explains it as well. That the Torah's word for love is also Amor. So the Shifti Kos says, here we see again, the Torah says, that in order for Kohanim to fulfill their obligation to bless the Jewish people, it has to be done with complete love. Why is love so important? Why do the Kohanim have to have love? Now, who are the Kohanim to, to the Jewish people? They're the leaders, they're the eyes, they're the ones who set the law, they're the ones who show the way. One of the reasons why someone who, bring, who did a sin, who wanted to bring a korban, is that if he comes up to the Beit Midrash and he sees the holiness of the Kohanim, it's going to make him do tshuva already because he's surrounded by holy people. And so in order to have proper influence, you have to have real love for the people. In order to be a great leader, for people, you have to come with complete love. If you're not there loving the people, it's going to be felt, and they're not going to be able to accept you, and then you're not going to accept them, it's going to be problematic. But if a person comes with love, the same thing with your children, right? You come approach them with love, and even though you're going to give them a strict punishment, or but if they see it's coming from a lovely, love, lovely or loving place, they are more attuned to accept whatever you tell them uh, and, and, and tell them what to do. The, um, if you go through our tzaddikim, one after the other, you'll see over and over again the love that they have for the Jewish people. But we'll mention here two short stories about two of our great chachamim. There was the Bet HaLevi, Rav Yosef Dov HaLevi Soloveitchik, was learning with his son, Rav Chaim, Rav Chaim of Brisk. And they were learning, and someone knocked on their door, the butcher sent his errand boy to ask uh, the, the, the Bet HaLevi if the lungs of this meat, if this animal was kosher or not, based on the lungs. And uh, the story goes that the Bet HaLevi, Har Yosef Dov Salavechik, was looking this way, that way, and said, no, nope. according to everyone, this lung would be terif. The whole animal is asur. The errand boy took the lung back to the butcher. And as you can imagine, the story goes, within a few minutes, the butcher ends up in the uh, rabbi's uh, study with his son over there. And he starts to scream and yell and say, what type of rabbi are you? You don't know any halakha. How could you answer this? It's always been kosher. And he said, you're making me lose tons of money. How could you do this? How can you do this? Screaming and yelling. And runs out of the Rav's house. As soon as the Rav, as soon as the man leaves the Rav's house, Rav Chaim says he saw his father get up. And his father said, Machulach, 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 I give you forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness to the man who just screamed at him. Within a few minutes, there's a whole big uproar in the city. What happened? This butcher went to the market to buy another animal. Hopefully the next animal will be kosher. And then he'll sell the non-kosher meat with the kosher meat. That was his plan. 
But when he came to the market to buy another animal, one of the cows got loose and trampled him and killed him. So people said it must be because he gave chutzpah. He was disrespectful to the rabbi that from Shemaim they punished him. When the Beit Levi heard what happened, he was devastated. He fasted. He asked for forgiveness. Every single year on the Yort side, he would learn. Say Kaddish. Say Mishnayot. For this man. This man who gave him chutzpah, the man who was not nice to him. His son said, why do you do so much? And he said, I don't forgive myself. Maybe because of me it happened. And the Beit Levi with his boundless love for every Jew, even for one who humiliated him, it did not permit him to rest, to forget what happened. He blamed himself and continued to try to do something for this Jew who passed. The love that goes beyond measure. That's what it means, the Kanim have to have love, they have to have beyond measure for love. The second story goes, there was a Holocaust survivor, he came to the United States and he needed to find a job. And uh, he couldn't really make any money. So he decided he's going to start a new service. At that time, eggs didn't come in a carton. If they came to the store, you bought eggs, you took it home whatever receptacle you brought with. So he decided he's going to start a delivery service. People can order from him eggs, and he'll bring it to the house intact. And if you send your kid to the store to get eggs and not without a carton, they'll come back more than half broken. So he decided to start the service. And uh, some people signed up, and he was able to make a living week after week. One day on his route, he brought him to Williamsburg. He dropped off the eggs at a certain house. And as he's walking out, he sees one of the shows trying to make a minyan for minha. So they, they ask him, can you be the tent? Be the tent. So he comes and he helps. And right after the minha ends, they start giving out eggs to everyone. So he asks the guy by there, is this a skivera minha? It's a skivera based medrash. So he says, this is the chsisha minha over here. So the Gabbai said, no, it's not a minute at all. The uh, Rebetzin buys extra eggs because she wants to help somebody who's selling eggs. And since she has nothing to do with the eggs, she brings it here and then we give it out to the people so everybody wins. <laughs> and his mind realizes that the Rebetzin, who he, who he didn't know was a Rebetzin, who she doesn't know who he was. There was no awards, no cars, no big things. She just wanted to help someone else because she loved clients, right? she loved Jews. She went out of her way to help somebody else just to help them. This is what it means to have love. To be a true leader, you have to have, you have to be not French, not Italian, but you have to be like a Kohen. You have to have real love. Uh, Rav Mordechai Kamenetsky says that when he moved to Woodmere, um, after a few months living in Woodmere, an uh, Israeli couple moved in to um, right next door to them. And, you know, and they thought that this, um, you know, they be Israeli, maybe they're modern, but they knew about Shabbat, Kashrut. And when they started to talk to them, they realized they knew nothing. They didn't keep anything. Not Talat Mishpacha, not Kashrut, nothing. And the Rabbi Kamenetsky didn't know what to do. How can he work with them to get them back being religious? So he went to the Rosh Yeshiva, who lived in the area, Rabbi Shlomo Freifeld. And he asked them what to do. How do I make my neighbors from Eretz Yisrael who don't know anything, how do I make them religious? And he says, Rosh Hashiva looked and said to him, you do nothing. He said, well, you do nothing. I have neighbors, I feel an achrayut, I feel responsibility. He said, all that you have to do is be a nice person, be a mensch. Every time you see them, say good morning. Say good afternoon. Say good evening. Make sure your lawn is neat and nice. Make sure your children are well behaved. And make sure they're friendly and let them play with their kids. Make sure that when they see you, they're going to like you and they're going to see that you represent Hashem. He said, follow you that advice and you will not have to do anything and they will come themselves closer to Torah and to mitzvot. Amor Kamenetsky says, we, did, we followed the advice. We invited them for meals, our children played together, we talked politics, 
We discussed gardening. We talked about everything except for religion. We never once brought up Torah, Mitzvot, nothing. I was therefore shocked when, about a year later, in October, our neighbors called us to find out which was the closest shul so they can attend Yom Kippur service. And I was surprised a few days later when I got a call asking me from them where they can buy a sukkah and if I can help them set it up. And one thing led to the next. They lived in the U.S. for five years and then they decided to go back to Eretz Yisrael because they said that they felt America was being too guyish for them. And so they went to go back to Eretz Yisrael to live amongst Jews. What did the person do? Absolutely nothing. What he did was he lived like a good person with love. He just was friendly, nice, talking to people, just loving people for who they are. I tell you something very true. This past two weeks, I've had people will go over to me, people who are not even Orthodox, but are Jewish, who walked over to me for no apparent reason. I was working in the hospital with somebody, he was an insta, doing an in-service, and he starts telling me how he's Jewish. He tells me he's a reform, but he loves Jews. He says, he loves religious Jews. He says, every time I see them, they're so friendly to me. They're so nice to me. They never mean, they never say anything to me. Why are you like this? Why are you like that? He says, just, he says, I wish I could become Orthodox too, but he says I'm already like 70 years old and I have my stuck in my ways. But he says, you have no idea how much I support them. And anytime I hear someone talking bad about them, I'm always defending them. Now, I didn't ask for the story. The guy sat for me for about 45 minutes. We were sitting and talking. Everything he was telling me. Then, this week, I went to a restaurant on Central Avenue. I was Before I got into the restaurant, I was putting some quarters into the meter. And... Uh, Someone walked over to me asking me for change. He needs a dollar, he wants to get the quarters. So I said, okay, I'll give you the quarters. I gave him the quarters. And then I was there for another 20 minutes as he was giving me his story. The kids are his story was, he's a Jew, also unaffiliated. And uh, he works with putting up wallpapers. And um, he says that he was once in a Sephardic person's home in Ocean Parkway area. He was putting up wallpapers and he saw the Jew was putting on uh, tefillin. So he says to him, Eddie, his name is the Sephardic Jew, says, Eddie, Eddie, you put, you put on this tefillin every day? He says, yeah, you, you don't? He says, I know you're Jewish. I heard you were Jewish. So this guy says, the last time I put on tefillin was my bar mitzvah day. I never put on tefillin since then. He says, that was the end of the story. I went on to continue my business. Next week, I get a phone call. He says, I get a phone call. And Eddie, Eddie's calling me, tells me I have to stop by the house. I tell him, what, is the job okay? Is something wrong with the job? He says, the job is perfect. I just need you to pick something up. So I made arrangements, he said, and I went, to, I, I went to his house. He wasn't home. His wife got for me a bag. And in that bag was the Eichler's bag, he says. The word Eichler's. He says, it was the Eichler's bag. And inside the bag, there was a pair of tefillin. He says, at first I didn't put it on. But I went to another Sephardic Jew's house. And uh, I told her, you know, this guy I went to, he bought me tefillin. She said, let me see it. She takes it, she looks at it, and she says, you know, this tefillin from Eichler's, I was in that store last week. This tefillin cost more than $1,500. My son got bar mitzvah, I bought him the uh, cheaper version. Your friend bought you the best version there is of the tefillin. He says that from that day, he's never missed a day of putting on tefillin. They taught him, he said he went to a rabbi to teach him the blessings to say, to say Shema. He says every single day since then, he puts on tefillin. Then he was sitting there and telling me the story. Again, I didn't ask for the story, I didn't tell him to tell me the story, but you see over and over again, when Jews, or anyone who's around people that see people love them, respect them, give them, it influences them, to change their ways and to love the Torah and mitzvot. That's our job. Our job is not to tell people what to do. It's not to tell people how to do. It's to be lovely to them like the Kohanim are. And then they themselves will come and tell me, tell us, tell me how to do this. How am I supposed to keep Shabbat? How am I supposed to keep Yom Tov? How am I supposed to pray? All this comes when they see how much we care for every single individual. 
We'll end off with one last lesson on this week's parasha. The Midrash says that Kla Yisrael complained to Hashem. When Hashem said the Kohanim were to give them a beracha, the Jewish people said, we don't need the Kohanim's beracha, we need your beracha. So Hashem said, even though I tell the Kohanim to give you beracha, I stand over them and I bless you. What does this mean? The Kitab Sofer explains. He says that this is what the Jews were complaining about. The Jews said, if people are going to give us blessings, people don't know what's really good for somebody or not. You can ask them today, today tomorrow, Hashem, please give me, what's the fanciest car? Porsche or whatever people like. Right? And he says, please give it to me, please give it to me, please give it to me. How does he know that that's actually good for him? Maybe that will be the instrument of his death. So the people said, why are you telling the Kohanim to give us a beracha? They don't know what we need. We want a beracha from you, Hashem. Because you know what's really good for us or not. Hashem, therefore, the Kitab Sofer explains, instructed the Kohanim to give a beracha that's a general beracha. There's no specifics. The bracha is Hashem should bless you and watch you. How bless you, how watch you, that is up to Hashem. It says in the Ashray that we say every single day, Ritzon Yirav Yaseh, what does it say next? Right? The will of those who fear Hashem, He will do. And their cry, He will listen to and save them. That's what it means. Hashem listens to those who fears Him. And to their cry, He will save them. The Baal Shem Tov says, I don't understand this whole pasuk. If Hashem does what they want, right? it says Hashem will listen to those who fear Him. Then why does he need to listen again to them crying? Hashem will listen to what they want, and when they cry, Hashem will listen. What does that mean? If they're ready to listen to what they wanted, why are they crying? So the Baal Shem Tov explains. Initially, Hashem listens to everybody for whatever they ask. Car, business, job, everything. Then a person gets it. And if Hashem Shalom is not good for him, he starts to cry and say, Hashem, why'd you give it to me? I don't need it. <coughs> So he says, if he's not a righteous person, Hashem doesn't listen to him. He lets the thing that he already got ruin him. But if he's a righteous person, then Hashem will listen to him again. After he asked for it and now he doesn't want it, he'll listen again and take it away. The Hafiz Chaim taught us that a person should never say to Hashem, please give me this or give me that. Rather, he should say, Hashem, I think I need this, I think I need that, but please answer me. Litova, for my good. Because we don't really know what's good for us. Once a person came to the Havetz Chaim and says, I won the lottery, but the lottery ruined me. I have no more money. I'm more poor than before I had won the lottery ticket. The Havetz Chaim says, I can't help you. We can't help me. I came to the rabbi for help. Chavetz Chaim said, you see, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives everybody how much they're supposed to get every week, every month, everything. You won the lottery. You know what happened when you won the lottery? All the money that you're supposed to get in the future came to you now. So now you already wasted it all. There's nothing for me to do. You have nothing left. Hashem just gave it to you earlier and now you have nothing. The Chavetz Chaim once asked the Jew, how is your business going? And he said, if it was just a little bit better, it wouldn't hurt. The Chavetz Chaim said to him, how do you know that? How do you know if your business went a little better that it wouldn't hurt you? And the opposite, if it did come a little better, it might hurt you. Because everything Hashem gives you is right for you right now. Hashem Shempinkas shares a story about there was a friend of his who was doing fundraising and he asked him to go get a certain car. And um, it was an expensive car and there was taxes and he had to get it out of uh, whatever place. And Hashem, because when he went there, he realized he didn't have the right papers. So he davened to Hashem 
that he should be able to get the car and he showed the, the, the authority person, he showed him some English papers. The man didn't know how to read English, he didn't want to admit to it. So he signed everything and let Rav Shimshon Pinkus take the car. Shimshon Pinkus took the car, brought it to his friend. That first ride his friend took in that car, he was Niftar. He had an accident. In the <coughs> Rav Shimshon Pinkus says, I saw from here that when a person davens, he gets what he wants. But when he davens, he doesn't know what he wants. And sometimes if we get what we want, but we don't know if it's the right thing, it can be very detrimental and it can be the end of that person. Therefore, when we daven, we pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, people ask, why doesn't Hashem give me this? Whatever He wants. Why didn't Hashem give me that? Why is Hashem... Why are you asking questions on Hashem? You're never going to understand Hashem. Why are you trying to understand what you can't understand? What we could understand is whatever Hashem gives us, this is what we need, this is what we must have, and you have to be besimcha, be happy. Hashem gave me. This is what I need. This is what I want. This is what everything that I need. Nothing else. Hashem gives everybody exactly what he needs, when he needs it, what he needs, all at the right time. So just to review quickly, our three lessons on this week's parasha. We had our first lesson that humiliation brings kapara, and humiliation gives a person bracha. So take it and use it properly. Don't get upset when someone gives you embarrassment. Take it. It's kapara. As well, a beracha. We also saw what it means to be a leader and how you have to treat with love. Really love everyone inside you. Everyone around you. Stop thinking all about yourself. It's about me. People should respect me. It's none of that. You don't need that. Don't worry about that. Just love everyone. Love a fellow Jew because he's a child of HaKadosh Baruch. <clears throat> and the third lesson that we learned is to always ask Hashem to give us what's best for us. Because we don't know. Just like a child does no idea what he wants or what she wants. They have no idea. If they would have the chance, they would eat candy all day from morning to night and then the stomach would go crazy and the teeth and whatnot. They don't know. They don't know. I mean, 18, 19, 20, they start to know. I, we're whatever age we are, we still also don't know what's great for us. Only HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows. Only the Almighty knows. Therefore, we ask Hashem, please answer us. May we see the Gerulah Shalema. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.